Thank you very much, Ofa. Um, so I'm always a little bit demanding. I have various riders when I get up here. And uh, one of them is I wonder if there's a glass of water anywhere. And the other is I wonder if there is um, a roving mic I could have because I have a slight tendency to wander once I get up here. Now, one of the things that people often look at, actually, there's something else I want to do. I want to bring two of my minders up here. Can I have Wally Stevens and Mike Platt? Can you join me on the platform here? Are you in the room? Yeah, they're right at the far, uh, right at the far end. Else. Thank you, Danny. They're right at the far end so that they could make a bit of, a, a bit of an entrance. Uh, but these are my two colleagues working with me uh, on Global Seafood Assurances. Mike Platt, who is our, please take a seat, our Standards Development Director at GSA, and Wally Stevens, who's the Executive Director of GSA, Global Seafood Assurances. And I want them up here so that when we get to questions, if there's any really hard stuff, they can answer them. And I'm very mindful that uh, when people look at this, they go, oh my goodness, not another standard setter, not another standard that we've got to adhere to. There's so many, we hear about complexity and confusion in the business of standards. So here's the good news. This is not another standard setter. This is not another standard, but it is, I'm afraid, another acronym, GSA. But I think we'll get over that. So what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about GSA, what we're hoping to do, um, and we want to involve all of you in that. Um, as Afer mentioned, a, a big part of that is the RFS, the Responsible Fishing Scheme, and our work with Seafish on that. And I'm going to then invite Mike to step up and talk a little bit more about the details of that. And then at the end, we can have a question session. And as I mentioned, refer the really tricky stuff to Wally, who is the, uh, the vision and the brains behind this originally. This is a bunch of very attractive people, uh, all based in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is about an hour north of Boston, uh, which probably many of you have been to. And it is um, not quite the full team of the Global Aquaculture Alliance. And there is a reason why I've put this up here. Uh, there's a question at the top there. What does it take to run a credible standard? And often, I think, you know, this is an untold story of what sits behind the business of standards. This team here, which I think uh, you can count them while I'm talking and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think there's 40, 41 people there. There are a few missing, some were abroad, whatever. This is what it takes um, to produce uh, standards for aquaculture that have integrity, product integrity. They are benchmarked. We collect data uh, in sophisticated IT systems. We look after clients. We help them, uh, clients in terms of production. So we're helping them achieve those standards. And we have programs to do that. We're looking after clients in terms of our retail partners and helping them to deliver good, safe, quality, assured aquaculture from around the world. Um, and this is what it takes to do that, all of the governance that goes with it. So when we think about creating a standard, that's often a very good response to a challenge that we might have. But the reality is we get to a point where we need a lot of infrastructure behind the scenes to make that thing work. So that's why I wanted to share that photograph with you. And I want you to keep that merry band of men and women in your mind. So. Wally used to be the executive director of GAA running um, all of these people. And uh, what he was doing, and I'm using this diagram uh, specifically to talk about aquaculture, but was to manage a full suite of standards that sat beneath the GAA umbrella called the Best Aquaculture Practice Standards. So GAA itself looks at things like education and knowledge sharing and research, um, all of what we think of as the pre-competitive space for all of this activity. The best aquaculture practice standards sit slightly to the side of that as a suite of standards that cover the supply chain for aquaculture. And uh, we've been doing that for about 20 years. I think Wally stepped in about 12 years ago and, and took this on. And it's very, very complex. And this is sort of, uh, okay, I'm going to have to just shout, but this is where... It becomes very complicated across this supply chain. The, f the piece at the beginning there is effectively GAA. That's a suite of technology, of data, of collecting of information, of sharing of information, of understanding how to educate people and help them come to this, this uh, suite of standards, this, uh, this best practice. 
Then we move into the production of the aquaculture itself. And in fact, I think aquaponics are also mentioned there. But we know in aquaculture, lots of different species, lots of different types of aquaculture. So a huge number of standards, each one of them with huge numbers of indicators and metrics within them. So already it's beginning to get very, very complex. Then we move into, we've harvested, let's say, that aquaculture. We move into the first point of production, so primary production. And each time we're moving this produce, it's, um, uh, we're told often that this is the most globally traded commodity in the world, seafood. It's moving, being handled all the time. It's gone into the primary processor at this point. We kind of keep track of it. We kind of put standards on it. Um, then we're probably into a secondary piece of processing or value added. It's moving towards the point of sale at this moment. Um, another suite of standards, making sure that it's safe, making sure that the people who are processing, they have decent work and so on, trying to keep track of the product as it moves through. Series of logistics, maybe it goes by all three of those. Maybe it goes by ship and plane and by, by lorry. And by now it's probably split from what it was originally into various different products. So it becomes a very, very complicated chain before it eventually arrives at this point of sale, whether that's in a restaurant or with large-scale buyers, the retail sector, and in the consumer. So just hold on to how many people it took to run those standards, the complexity of how we're moving this stuff around, how we're producing it, how we're putting the logistics in, how we're collecting all of that data. Bear with me. It'll come together like a cunning plan. So 20-odd years of uh, best aquaculture practice standards, and this is uh, an example of... What we call our endorsers, uh, we have different names for things wherever we work. Uh, they might be our partners, our retail brand partners. They might be our customers, our clients. Whoever. But these are the people um, who are using uh, the best aquaculture practice standards to assure themselves of their supply chain in aquaculture. And there'll be a number of different uh, companies that you will recognize. I can see Tesco. I can see Young's. I can see Sainsbury. And there are all sorts of different littles in there. Uh, European, North American, and indeed China, your JD.com right in the middle. They're taking retail to a whole new thing. They went from corner store straight to online. They missed out all that stuff in the middle that we're currently doing, really, in Europe. So that's another whole dimension, again, of logistics. And, and it's worth putting this up here because these are the people who are wanting that assurance all the way through their supply chain. They need to mitigate that risk. And for them, it's all about seafood. Yes, it is really important to understand whether your seafood is farmed or wild, to a point. And I'm sorry if that's a little controversial, but when I'm the consumer stood in the retail outlet or I'm looking at the menu, at that point, it very often becomes the business of seafood. And in the big buying uh, spaces and even in restaurants, very often it's the business of buying fish, buying seafood. As we get towards that point of sale, it becomes seafood and less about whether it's farmed or wild. We want to know that stuff, but it's now beginning to sort of group together as it makes it towards someone's plate. And that's quite an important thing to remember. And I put these up here just as some examples of why the business of seafood is increasingly um, important. You know, this kind of uh, increase in aquaculture that we're going to need, the sort of uh, levels of... Um, employment and one of the reasons why social issues and decent work in fisheries around the world is so important and that's reflected in this tweet um, which is actually quite recent but uh, is about two months three months ago I think when Myanmar started to write an MOU uh, with Thailand to get 60,000 people across the border to be working in Thailand and we know that some of that seafood a lot of that seafood is being imported into Europe into the UK into North America we want some assurance around that seafood when that happens. We want to make sure that those workers are getting decent work, they're being looked after. And it's very much in the press. People are very, very aware of these issues. And they've seen that in coffee and in cocoa and in other commodities. And we need to remember that too, that we're sitting in the business of food. So um, we'll move on from that one. But I want you to just think about the fact that this is seafood. So the reason I think it's important that it's seafood is because... For all of those endorsers of BAP, of the Best Aquaculture Practice Standards that you saw on that earlier slide, they're dealing in the business of seafood and they're choosing BAP as their partner for assurance. But they're choosing other things to do with wild capture to give them assurance there as well. And what we know, 
is that CFESH have done an amazing job in the UK in creating one of the very first vessel standards associated with the business of wild capture seafood. Because right now, and we'll look at this again in a little bit more detail in, in about two slides, but in aquaculture, we have, by and large, been able to put together full supply chain assurance. Um, but in the business of wild capture, there are some big gaps. I'll come back to that in a moment. And one of those big gaps was recognised as being what happens on a vessel. Are people safe on a vessel? Um, is the vessel acting appropriately? Who's responsible for that? All those kind of questions. Seafish saw that some time ago. They responded um, in accordance with their members to come up with the responsible fishing scheme. But, and I take you back to slide number one, 41 to 45 people that it takes to run standards appropriately. All that governance, all that resource, all that input. Not only just to run it, but to really make it successful, to really understand what you're achieving, what you're changing, the value that you're adding out of creating and running that standard. And so, quite rightly, they thought, right, we need some support to, to take this forward. And uh, that's where we got involved, because we thought it would be a very good idea to uh, use our extensive experience in the business of standards to look at the gaps that were existing in the wild capture supply chain. So these are the, uh, what we would call endorsers in our language, but they're the supporters, they're the partners currently uh, with the responsible fishing scheme. And a lot of those you'll have seen on the, on the BAP endorsers slide as well. So we have some crossover there. We have some friends in the space already, people that we can work with. And again, these people will be dealing in seafood. They'll also be dealing in, it very probably, I haven't looked at them all in detail, pretty sure they're also dealing in, in farmed, most of them as well. So I think it were two years of discussion altogether and a full tender process and all sorts of things and we jumped through before we came to an agreement with Seafish for something that would work for all of us. And when I say all of us, I mean everybody in the room and the extended Seafish membership, together with these endorsers, with the BAP endorsers, with these global seafood supply chains, um, around the business of vessel standards. And we created the Global Seafood Assurances. This was already a vision that we had, and we recognised the gaps that were needed to be filled if we were going to do this on the wild capture side. The opportunity came forward with RFS, the negotiations that I've referred to, um, the, the cohesion that we already had, and that's where, when we began to set about this in earnest. So I think we'll tweak some of this language. I think we're in early stages still of putting this whole baby together. Um, but I think it's the raw language which really does capture the mission and vision of what we're trying to do here. Um, so it's really about creating end-to-end -end supply chain assurance for seafood. So if you're, if you're the buyer or the consumer, a supply chain ends at that point. It doesn't start at that point. And traditionally, we've looked at supply chains for seafood from starting points. So I guess what we're doing now is looking at it from the end point and making sure that we've built it all the way through. So that is the vision, and we need to um, do quite a lot of work to get to that. But we think that that will have some great implications um, around good work, around um, helping to manage fisheries, around improvements, around confidence with consumers. Um, around uh, co more collaboration in the business of seafood to create more efficiencies and so on. I'll leave you to read that. Some of you are photographing it. I think the language will tweak. We will amend that and we'll do that with you and the extended community as well. But I think it gives you a sense for what, what we're trying to do here. The principle is end-to-end -end assurance in the seafood supply chain. And just to remind you of what that's like, and this is why I wanted a mic, really, because I do like to dance around a little bit. You might have noticed that I'm a bit of a fidget stood behind a platform. But if we look at this business on aquaculture, we have got, if I start at this end with hatchery, we can go hatchery, we can go farm, we can go primary processing, we can go secondary processing, we can get through logistics, and we can get to point of sale, and we can pretty much connect all those things together. And at the moment, they're connected through a chain of custody, pretty much one up, one down. So not the most robust in the world in terms of traceability, but it has a connectivity and it has a traceability. Um, the one that I, I like to use the word imposter, so I don't know if anyone in the room will mind. That processing plant isn't a unique seafood processing plant at the moment. Use the mic, please. Yeah. I thought I was loud enough, but it's okay. I'll go back. It's okay. It's okay. Normally, people accuse me of being too loud. 
But on the, uh, on the wild capture side, and this is going to be a lot easier, we kind of start here in wild capture and we can certify with some of the best uh, systems in the world the business of fisheries management from an environmental perspective. And then we jump to here, which is um, point of sale for that product. And there's very little that's filling the gap in between other than a processing plant standard, which is being supplied by a, a very credible and fantastic organization, but is not seafood specific. And uh, you know, that, that's another little weakness in that, in that space as well. And we have a chain of custody, again, one up, one down. So what I want you to imagine, and I've very nearly finished my piece, what I want you to imagine is that you had full supply chain traceability from start to finish on both sides. And then I want you to imagine just for a moment that we had jumped forward a couple of years and we were capable of then, because we have full supply chain trace, uh, uh, assurance, of connecting that together with 21st century block style chain traceability. And we have another gentleman in the room who's got uh, the UK seafood industry that we've introduced him to very excited this week. Um, take a bow, Andy. I can see you sat there. Take a bow. There he is. And he's also based with um, GAA, uh, just north of Boston in Portsmouth. And it's not his dashing good looks that's got everybody excited that we've introduced him to. It's the fact that Andy is passionate about the business of blockchain style traceability, is building platforms and piloting that at the moment. And it's not ready to go live. It's ready to be piloted. Um, but once we can put those full supply chain assurances together, and we can put that together with those kind of systems, then we have something really robust in the seafood industry that can service the kind of growth that we're looking at, the opportunity that we have within the business of seafood. So we've had to start that uh, with these principal activities, filling of the gaps, filling of the gaps in, in there, uh, and that we're starting that with the RFS. Mike's going to tell you a little bit more about that in a moment, how we're doing that to, to look at the vessel standards. We then noticed that there are other... Um, smaller organizations who've created specialist standards who are not perhaps able then to service them in the way that they want to and there may be opportunity to bring those into the family if you like they remain they would remain under the ownership of those organizations but we could perhaps with our infrastructure offer some sort of service to them to do that um, I'm going to jump to here, the standard partners. We would very much hope that um, some of the existing big standards who are benchmarked to the kind of quality that BAP is will also join us in this venture to, to put together full supply chain assurance and traceability. Um, and, then, uh, and then collaborating on these traceability systems, uh, which is why we've introduced Andy very tentatively to excite some of our partners in the UK. And uh, before I hand over to Mike, I want to just share with you one piece of news that we've been really excited about this week, which is going to go live tomorrow, is that um, Marcus from Seafish, the CEO of Seafish, has agreed to join the GSA board to help us build this and build it in a way that's going to work both for RFS and Seafish, but even more broadly for the business of uh, assured seafood supply chains. So to explain a little bit more about that work, Mike's going to now join us and... Uh, tell us how the RFS development is going. Some of you have been involved in that. And then we can do some Q&A if we have time. All Thank yours, you. Boss. Thank you. Okay. Does this work? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Um, yes, I've been working closely with the Seafish team. Um, so this is very much a partnership arrangement. Uh, as you know, there was an MOU signed between GSA and Seafish, and as part of that MOU, uh, GSA would support in the development of a version two of the RFS. So what we've started over the past three months with Helen and her team is an extensive consultation process. But before I go into that, we, we had a transition plan that we agreed, and I'll just share this with you that we were looking to see where the RFS actually sat. So it actually sits, as Melanie said, within the supply chain at the vessel side. So the GSA ethos is the fact that we're looking for end-to-end uh, -end, uh, supply chain assurance, and the RFS is a key player in that particular 
uh, role of what we would actually like to try and develop over the forthcoming years. So looking at the transition plan, we have stage one, which is the ongoing program management for RFS. This is to version one, this is the current standard, and this is solely still being run by Seafish and uh, Helen's team. And this is to ensure that the business uh, of continuity remains for all those vessels that have applied and are currently certified to the RFS standard. What we are now starting is a review of that current standard to see which areas we feel uh, should be retained, which areas should be streamlined, which new areas should be included, and this is being done through an extensive consultation period. We're doing this by consulting with the UK industry, all sectors of the UK industry, from catchers to primary processors, secondary processors, the retailers, food service, government, everybody who has got some connection directly or indirectly with the seafood sector. So over the pathway, it's going to take around about three months, we're going to take as much feedback as we can to actually try and determine which are the best bits of the RFS that we want to keep and which areas we would like to tweak to ensure that it meets with the future demands of the supply chain and the market. What we're also looking at is at some point we will be moving the RFS program over to that team uh, that Melanie showed you. Um, so we're actually looking at a transition plan, looking at all the processes and procedures required to actually operate and run the RFS program. One of the key areas that the Seafish team is working on is a group model. We believe that this is a, a fantastic way of actually uh, improving accessibility to the RFS standard. So I'm working with the uh, RFS team to ensure that what is developed will meet with the requirements of the, the BAP, because they run group standards as well, so we're fully in alignment. At the end of this transition plan, the RFS program will transition over to GSA. This will happen no later than May 2020, so there's an awful lot of work to be done between now and then. This, I'm just going to show you a few slides. Um, these are the slides that we've used as throughout the consultation period. As I mentioned, we've done an extensive consultation uh, mapping to actually try and identify as many stakeholders as possible. So this has the, been the work that's been done by Seafish. And what we've done within GSA is also input into that process, as well as speak to our international partners as well. So we can try and gather as much intelligence as possible to ensure that whatever we decide should be in version two will be fit for the UK market, and that's paramount, but also be, be capable of being used by the international market as well. One of the areas that we're looking at is we know that there's a lot of fishermen and fisherwomen who actually catch for the UK market, but they also catch for the export market. So we want to be able to produce a product that they can use as well. Also, there's a lot of seafood, and we've seen in this summit today, that's actually imported into the UK. Again, we're asked the question, are we going to develop a standard just for the UK, which could penalise us against other international fleets? No. What we're going to do is produce a standard that will be uh, applicable uh, globally across all fishing communities. So that consultation period is well underway. Uh, we've, we've run four work workshops throughout the UK. I don't know, Helen, how many one-to-one -one meetings we've planned, but hundreds. Yeah. And, and again, this is another great consultation opportunity for us. So Helen, myself, please you know, send us your feedback. We're also looking at the accreditation bodies. So ISO 17065, that's a standard on how you actually certify to a standard. We're also talking to GSSI, we're talking to GFSI, and there's a new one from the Consumer Goods Forum, which is a sustainable supply chain initiative. Again, we're reaching out to them as well to ensure that anything that we produce will be benchmarked and will be credible. After this process, we will be creating what we call a terms of reference document, uh, which will actually identify the key areas of, 
opportunity for the RFS. This will be presented to the RFS Oversight Board, which is made up of representatives from the UK industry. And also we've now included some uh, of our Im exporters and importers uh, within the UK as well, so we can capture their feedback. Once we've actually agreed the terms of reference, not only with the uh, Oversight Board, these will then be ratified by the Seafish Board as the standard holder, and also the GSA Board. So, delighted to have Marcus on the GSA Board, because we get that continuity between both boards. Once that's all been done, and we're hopeful that that should be concluded before the end of this year, we will formulate a technical advisory committee. These will be made up of representatives from the industry with specific knowledge and skill to allow us to reform the RFS to actually meet the requirements of the terms of reference. The one thing that I will say here is we're not looking at completely chopping up the RFS, throwing it away and starting something new. This is a reform of the RFS. So we're looking to make sure that we keep the best bits and reform the bits that from feedback need to be done. By the end of this year, we're looking to actually start the development of version two. Fingers crossed, we'll see how it goes. Once we've actually developed the standard through that technical advisory committee, we'll undertake an extensive pilot regime. So we are going to pilot um, vessels that catch in UK waters, supply the UK market. We'll also look at vessels that catch in UK waters but supply the export market. But also, we'll be looking at vessels that catch internationally, but supply the UK. We're also very keen at this point to look at some of our international stakeholders as well, to keep them informed in the process, so they can actually see, yes, this is the standard to be with. And that's certainly something through dialogue, through the GSA, that we'll be doing on a regular basis. Once we've actually gone through a pilot phase, we will, like any good standard, go through a public consultation. Again, to try and capture that final piece of the jigsaw of those bits of uh, feedback that we haven't managed to capture so far. And also to make sure that the industry feel that we've captured the brief. Once we've done all this, it then goes through the approval process, which is very strong uh, to allow us to ensure that the governance is being followed and that the standard that we create will have that credibility, transparency and robustness. And it will be ready for uh, the new applicants to the standard. Uh, we're looking mid to the end of 2019. That's really all I've got to say at this point, but I'd like to hand over to Wally to ask if you would like to say anything about GSA, this is your vision, and um, thank you very much. Okay, um, in the interest of time, I'll say I've been around this industry a long time. 35 years I did what most of you people do in this room, bought and sold fish, uh, distributed seafood uh, throughout North America, was involved in management of fleets for ground fish in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and clam surf clams in Maryland and herring fisheries in Maine and shrimp and lobster in Nicaragua and halibut and Pacific cod, Pacific salmon in the state of, of Washington. And we had varying degrees of performance on board those fishing vessels, many of which we owned. We have a company by the name of Booth Fisheries, uh, uh, a company that did not keep abreast of change and after 148 years went out of business. And some of that going out of business was a consequence of not keeping up. And I, I think what I've seen in my career is that successful people, successful businesses stay abreast of, of the challenges that are, that are facing them. We saw this opportunity with Seafish. We see this program called the Responsible Fishing Scheme, and we say, this needs to be the model. We create this model in the UK. We take this model around the world because this completes the assurance chain for wild caught fisheries as we've already completed it for, for aquaculture products. So we can start to talk about seafood. We can start to talk about increasing demand for seafood. 
we've ad addressed the risk associated with seafood. We can now talk about marketing. So, fun trip. We look forward to, to, to working with you. Really pleased with uh, the response we've had with uh, the folks at Seafish. Uh, and we'll, we'll do the best doggone job we can do to make you guys proud of what you've created, what you've launched over, over many years. So, any questions?